Let's say you're designing an enemy. You want this enemy to wander until it spots something, then chase that target. And if it gets close enough, give it an attack. How would you program this? It would be super simple to check whether there's a target and whether we're in range, then handle the different time for wandering and all the randomness. But imagine you added a few more states to that. Maybe you could see how this code would grow larger and larger. Even though this is a smaller example, I personally would use a finite state machine. First off, before we define a finite state machine, we should probably define what a state is. A state is a set of conditions and a behavior to go along with it. So our wander state from before had the conditions that there was no target, and the behavior is wander randomly. And of course, our chase behavior was that we have a target, and that we're not in range, and that behavior is to chase. And that's kind of how we would split things up in code. So we would have a state class, and inside of the state class, we would have a couple of methods. The first two are enter and exit, which are called when we transition to a state and leave from a state. Then we'll have two functions. Those are the update and physics update functions. The update is tied to the visual frame rate, whereas the physics is tied to the physics server. Then each state can have its own relevant information. For example, the wandering state would probably have a random direction, and maybe a speed, and maybe a time for it to wander. Then inside of the inner function, we would randomize these variables. And on update, we would tick down the timer. And if it reaches zero, we would randomize the variables again. Then inside of physics, we would probably move. And for all of the other states, it would probably be a very similar story. That's basically it for the state. And the finite state machine is simply just a collection of these states. So in our case, we would have an idle, chase, and attack state. These would all belong to one state machine. The state machine itself is responsible for handling the life cycle. So for example, if we're moving between states, it's responsible for calling the exit function on the previous state and the inner function on the new one. And it's also responsible for keeping track of what the current state is. Usually, the actual state machine is completely agnostic to what states are inside of it. It just needs to know what the current state is and what state you want to move to. So let's swap over to Godot and we'll give this a shot. So we're back in the project from before, and all I've got is this little dude. He's got a script on him that just calls move and slide, and we'll set the velocity later using the states. So the first thing I'll do is add a new state script. This will be the base script used for all other states later, so we'll set up the functions in here. We'll declare class name state and define the functions enter, exit, update, and physics update. All of these will just contain pass because we don't actually want to do anything in these functions right now. You technically could, but for our project, I'll just leave these blank. Next, I'll go ahead and add a new node to the enemy and just call this state machine. Then I'll attach a new script. So the plan is to have the state machine in the scene tree and every state can just be a child of that node. So what I'll do is I'll define a states dictionary and then inside of the ready function, I'll loop over all of the children. And if the child is a state, I can add it to the dictionary by using its name. And since state extends node, we can check directly here whether it's a state or not. I'll go ahead and track the current state, and then we'll go ahead and define the process and physics process functions. And inside of here, we can check if we have a current state and call update and physics update respectively on the current state. But how do we move between states? Well, there's a billion different ways you could do it, but in my personal way, I would use signals. We'll head back over to the state class and add a new signal transitioned. Anytime we want to leave the state, we'll just call this signal. And inside of the state machine, anytime we register a new state, we can simply connect to the transition signal. This will connect to a function that takes in the state that called it and the new state name that it wants to transition to. We can check if the state calling it is not the current state, and then we'll grab the new state from the state dictionary, and of course make sure that exists. Then we'll check if we have a current state. If we do, we'll call dot exit, and then we'll call dot enter on the new state and set the current state to the new state. One quick thing is down here, I use two lower, and I will actually add that up here as well, just to make sure capitalization doesn't do anything funky. And then one last thing is I'll add an exported variable called initial state, where we can define the initial state that we want the state machine to be in. We'll check if initial state exists, and if it does, we'll call dot enter, and then we'll set current state to initial state. And then next, we can start building out our separate states. The first state I'll make is just idle. I'll start by making a new script, and I'll just call this enemy idle. Instead of extending node, we'll instead extend state and set the class name to enemy idle. And inside of this state, we'll have the two randomized variables, which are move direction and wander time, and then a function to randomize those variables. And then when we enter the state, we'll just call that random function. And then the update function should be really simple. We'll just check if wander time is greater than zero. If it is, we'll tick down using delta. And then otherwise, we'll just randomize these variables again. And then for the physics update, we'll actually add two more variables. These are a reference to the enemy that we're going to be updating and the move speed that we want to update to. Then in the physics update, we'll check if enemy exists. And if it does, we'll just set the velocity to direction times speed. And then of course, we probably want to test this to make sure this works before we go any further. So I'll go over to the state machine and add a new node. If we search enemy idle, we should see this here. And I'll assign the enemy and then I'll assign the initial state. Then if I go in game, it looks a little jank, but he's definitely moving around. 
And just for visuals, back in the enemy, I've added it so that if we're moving, we're going to play the run animation and flip the sprite based on which way we're going. And that already looks a lot better. I'll go ahead and rename this to just idle, and we'll do one more state together. So back down in states, I'll add a new script, and this one will be enemy follow. And just like before, we'll extend state and set up the class name. And we of course need to know what we're following. For this example, I'll just assume we're following the player, and I'll add the player to its own group. Then I'll add a player as a target, and inside of the inner function, I'll just grab the player from the group. And for the physics update, just like before, I'll add in a reference to the enemy and the move speed. And then inside of the function, we'll get the direction between the player and the enemy. And if it's outside of some distance, we'll move the enemy towards the player. Otherwise, we'll have it stand still. And of course, we want to test this one too. So I'll add it as a child. I'll assign the enemy and set the initial state to the follow state. And I'll also rename it to just follow. Then if I go in game, he follows. So the last thing to do is moving between states. This is very much state dependent, and I think it's a lot easier if I do it for the follow state first. So for the follow state, we want it to go back to being idle once we've reached a certain threshold. So I'll say if the distance is greater than 50, we'll call transition.emit. Note that we're passing in the current state and the name of the new state that we want to go to. And if we give this a shot in game, we can see that he stops following us after a certain distance. And back in idle, we can do the exact same thing. Of course, we'll need a reference to the player, so we can grab that from the tree. And inside of physics update, we can grab the direction between the player and the enemy. And if it's within some threshold, we can then transition to the follow state. And if we give that a shot in game, we can see he swaps to idle. And if we get close, he starts to follow again. That's the absolute basics of a state machine, but there are a lot of things you could clean up about this. For example, you notice how both of these states have access to the enemy, but instead of having access to the enemy directly, there could be an intermediate state object that these states modify and the enemy just grabs every frame. Or since you notice that these three variables are duplicated between idle and follow, you could extract them to an enemy state class and have all of the enemy states extend from that. But regardless of that, I hope this is a good look at how state machines can be used.